Good morning, everyone. I'm Cal Rastiala, director of the UCLA Burkle Center for International Relations. And it's my pleasure to invite you back to another, or welcome you back to another one of our Zoom sessions that we're doing this year. Today, I have the great pleasure of having as our guest, Dr. Fiona Hill. Um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Hill in a moment, but before I do that, let me just lay down our, our ground rules and procedure and also just let uh, those of you know who are interested in our, in our series of talks uh, that our next talk will be on October 26th, which is, which is a Monday. We've traditionally done these on a Tuesday this fall, but it'll be a Monday with my colleague from the law school at UCLA, Tendai Achiyumi, who is currently the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism and Xenophobia. Um, so that'll be the 26th. So today, uh, in a moment, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Hill. Uh, she and I will have a brief conversation uh, as we often do. And then I will open it up to questions from all of you. So please send your questions in using the Q&A feature. And I will pull from that uh, usually long list of questions and we'll run for about one hour. Um, so our special guest, some of you know uh, Fiona Hill from her recent testimony, uh, but she has a long career, both in the US government, in think tanks and in academia. Um, she's currently a senior fellow at the Center on the US and Europe uh, in the foreign policy program at Brookings uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, and she's worked uh, in and around the US government for many years, though as you'll discover in a moment, she's not, um, well, I don't know if she is American now. She may be American now, she guess she is. Um, but she was not born in the United States. Uh, she'll reveal that through her uh, lovely accent. So she worked as a senior director for European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council, uh, and previously as a national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia uh, at the National Intelligence Council. Um, she's written several books, articles, uh, a book on Putin. She's a sort of Putin expert uh, and generally an expert on Russia and Asia, which will be our topic for today. So uh, Fiona, welcome. Thanks so much, Carl. That's really great to be here. Well, I'm really glad to have you. And uh, I know everyone is interested to uh, talk about a number of different things. And so what I want to do is both talk about some current events um, with you and also uh, some things that we may see in the future, what, you know, some, some, some things to fear or, or, or hope for. Um, but I thought maybe what I would start with is something that's in the news right now and of interest, I think, to a lot of people in the, in the Los Angeles community, which is um, what's going on um, in Nagorno-Karabakh and um, the role of, uh, of Russia uh, in that, and also the significance for, for Russia and the West in that emerging conflict. So, um, so some of you listening and watching may know uh, there's been conflict in this kind of Armenian enclave. Uh, there's been protests here in LA about that. Uh, we have a very large Armenian community here in Los Angeles. Um, so I thought maybe we could just begin with that. And if you wanted to offer some thoughts on what you think is happening and is there a greater significance for how we should think about Russian um, Russian interest in the region and, and more generally. No, thanks uh, very much uh, for that, Carl. In fact, I was out in um, Los Angeles several years ago um, to take part in um, a meeting with um, our Armenian diaspora groups uh, out in Pasadena, um, in fact, uh, to discuss Nagorno-Karabakh with another um, uh, regional expert and had a really fascinating set of meetings uh, with uh, members of the Armenian diaspora in, um, in California many of whom come from um, very different uh, backgrounds. Um, I mean, most of us, first of all, should remember that um, the historic territories of Armenia uh, were much greater than modern Armenia, which was really the kind of a small province of a, of a much a larger territory. Uh, and part of uh, the Armenian territory was taken over by Russia, absorbed into the Russian empire after various struggles with the Ottoman and uh, Persian uh, empires. Uh, so Armenians were all um, over Anatolia, that was kind of like the, the sort of center of the Armenian heartland um, in what's uh, modern day Turkey, into Iran, uh, Syria, and all over the Middle East. And, you know, the Armenian diaspora in um, Los Angeles really reflects that. There's also, as I learned, and I'd forgotten about that until I actually met with uh, some members of the diaspora, an Armenian diaspora extending up into the Balkans because it's where the Ottoman Empire had extended and Armenians you know, often you know, followed the migration tracks as well as now thanks uh, to um, you know, the horrors of the genocide in 1915, large Armenian diaspora groups in the United Kingdom where I originally hailed from in France, uh, other parts of Europe and of course um, in the United States as well as Lebanon and, uh, and, other, and other countries. 
So Armenia is an international issue. It's not just a forgotten uh, country um, sandwiched in between um, you know, Russia and, uh, and Turkey in the Caucasus. And the current conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh um, also has very deep roots. The most recent um, uh, outbreak of conflict really dates back to the fall of the Soviet Union. And in the late 1980s, when Mikhail Gorbachev um, had a number of Armenian, ethnic Armenian advisors in his group, and they were pressuring him to consider the future of Nagorno-Karabakh. As you said, it's um, uh, um, uh, an enclave within Azerbaijan, uh, which was another republic of the Soviet Union, and then became an independent state. And the demography there was changing. You know, this is like in many conflicts, a majority group suddenly starts to find itself as a minority group or potentially as a minority group or losing that majority. And uh, due to uh, birth rates in the Azeri community in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenians, you know, were kind of facing the prospect that they would no longer be the dominant group in, you know, several decades ahead. And there was pressure to um, have Nagorno-Karabakh recognized as part of Armenia. Now, that's just a long background to basically saying that uh, what should have been, you know, uh, political discussions got out of hand in all of the, um, the, the upheaval that surrounded the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. And um, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, we saw a lot of fighting uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan as well as the communities within Nagorno-Karabakh itself, the Azeris and uh, Armenian communities. The complicating factor there is not just Armenians and uh, Azeris lived in that region, you always have Yazidis, um, you know, we've also seen in Syria and um, also Kurds, uh, many of whom are um, Armenian speaking, some spoke Azeri and some spoke Georgian, another of the republics there. So this is a very complicated um, uh, story here. And in 1994, after the fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh, the first time there was a ceasefire that was broken between Russia and Turkey, because Turkey, uh, as Ottoman Empire, had ceded in a part of the territory in 1920. So we're 100 years on from you know, earlier conflicts there. Now what we're seeing is a potential spat between Russia and Turkey over this. We saw that already playing out in Syria, where there's still a large Armenian community. Uh, as well as a large Kurdish community that uh, Turkey perceives as a security threat. We've seen Russia and Turkey at times come very close to confrontation in Syria, including at a time when the Turks shot down um, a Russian plane. So I, I'm telling you all of this uh, to the audience, many of whom know all this very well, and there's obviously a lot more detail and nuance to this, to get across this is a really complex situation. And in the past, the United States has played a very important role in helping to manage this conflict. We haven't done very well on resolution, but basically for the last 26 uh, years, we've managed to keep the lid on an outbreak of conflict until now. And, and really things have got out of control, I would say, partly because of a vacuum. The United States has stepped back and not done very much. Uh, we've, we've always been um, constrained by the fact that we do have a very large Armenian diaspora, which is very important in our politics as well as in our culture and our communities. But we've also, you know, developed a pretty uh, good relationship with Azerbaijan, uh, particularly through energy development uh, in the 1990s. And, you know, we, we've had a hard time, you know, trying to figure out how to balance all of these interests off and to try to find a way forward. We've also had to work with the Russians and the French who have a large um, Armenian diaspora in a group to manage this. And we've just failed to find a solution. And as we've seen frustrations have mounted in the region, there's also Iran in here as a factor. And up until now, the Iranians um, haven't really made uh, much comment, but Ar Iran has very um, close relations with Armenia. There's Armenians in uh, the Northern part of Iran and also with Azerbaijan, because the largest part of the population in Northern Iran are actually, actually ethnic Azeris. So, and I think many of the members of the diaspora community in um, uh, Los Angeles area also come from Iran, as well as other parts of, uh, of the Middle East. So I can imagine that, you know, for people listening to this, to this is particularly painful. It brings in a lot of very bad memories, of course, from more than 100 years ago with the genocide in 1915, but also of all these previous um, outbreaks of violence, including in Syria, where we saw, you know, kind of a replay, you know, several years ago in the Syrian civil war of attacks uh, and also by you know, the rise of um, Islamic terrorism on Armenian, Yazidi and other uh, Kurdish and other communities in the territory. So this is fiendishly complex and we are not doing a very good job right now of getting ahead of this outbreak of conflict. And what is Russia's interest in this? I mean, I first of all, thank you for a wonderful overview of it. Uh, 
does Russia have an interest in a resolution or in a sense, does Russia have an interest in fomenting more chaos, more conflict? It, it seems oftentimes Russia seems to revel in that. So I'm curious about this particular case. And then more generally in the region, you mentioned Syria and other, um, other conflicts, some of which are obviously much larger, long lasting. Um, does Russia uh, tend to have a kind of preference for chaos? And do we see that playing out in these different instances? Well, Russia takes advantage of chaos um, because it wants to insert itself into situations to try to become the arbiter of the outcome or to prevent an outcome. You know? So I mean, in the case of Armenia and Azerbaijan, Armenia uh, and Russia are, are very tightly um, joined together still through a military defense agreement. Russia has a base in Armenia. Um, Russia also provides the border guards uh, for Armenia's borders because, of course, Armenia has contentious relations not just with Azerbaijan but also with Turkey and is essentially landlocked and cut off apart from uh, the border with neighbouring Georgia. It doesn't have a direct border with Russia, for example. And, um, you know, Russia has also got a whole host of economic uh, treaties with Armenia as well and is often messed about in Armenian politics. Um, uh, Russia's also been supplying Armenia with weapons, but at the same time, Russia's also been uh, trying to, you know, kind of uh, maintain a stasis in its relations with Azerbaijan. And uh, so Russia's been basically playing both sides off against each other. In 2010, it looked like the Russians were actually serious about trying to find um, a breakthrough in Nagorno-Karabakh on their own terms. But they, you know, um, hit the same wall everybody else has. It's just incredibly difficult to um, reconcile what are really maximalist claims on both sides. Um, you know, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, Nagorno um, want to have a say, um, obviously, in um, the, what their future is. This isn't just a dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, forces, Armenian forces occupied uh, large parts of territory that were not previously disputed in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan wants them back. Uh, Armenia um, has Nagorno-Karabakh as part of its tourist maps, as if, you know, Armenia was just fully part, uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was fully part of Armenia. There's all kinds of things going on here that are difficult to resolve. And I think the Russians prefer managed chaos because they would have to force a compromise. Both sides would be angry with them. It's much better to play them off against each other. The problem comes when now, when the conflict's got out of control, it's no longer managed chaos. And in fact, it's become potentially unmanageable and now Turkey's in on the act. And as I said, we'll have to see whether Iran um, is, a, is a factor here too. The United States um, was a kind of stabilizing factor in you know, everybody being able to play the United States off against everyone else as well. And we had a vested interest obviously in trying to stabilize this. We would have loved to find a resolution, but we honestly didn't have the wherewithal to bring that because there are too many different factors on the table here. And I think it is very similar in um, the Middle East, in Syria. Russia took advantage of the chaos of uh, the civil war, of the rise of ISIS and all the, um, you know, the, the terrorists uh, that um, took hold in Syria as well as in Iraq. And Russia intervened in the Syrian civil war to prop up Assad, but also to try to play this arbiter role. And now Russia's got itself a bit um, stuck in Syria as well. It's not bogged down. It's not a, an incredible... Um, uh, expensive operation. It's not like the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, but it's also complex for Russia because they haven't been able to do what they wanted to do, which was put Assad back in power and get everybody else to pay for the reconstruction of Syria and to stabilize everything. And in fact, they've almost um, got into confrontations with Turkey at different points as well. And the US is not playing a very major role there either. And again, you know, when everybody likes to kind of complain about the United States in an issue when the United States isn't there, they have the responsibility. So I think Russia's now in the uncomfortable position that we've been in, which is like, okay, you know, how do we get out of this? How do we manage this? And how do we bring everyone along? So better to take advantage of chaos, but when you're actually managing it, you're supposed to get a resolution, then you find that it's much more difficult. So thinking about, uh, I guess, Europe and, and kind of the general relationship between Russia and kind of border bordering countries or, or traditional Russian sort of satellite countries in some cases. I'm curious about what you think the US should be doing. So you mentioned sort of a power vacuum in this particular context we were just speaking of, um, but it's a more general problem, of course, of the US pulling back and being erratically involved. Um, but thinking about the rise of so many illiberal regimes throughout the world, but particularly, let's say, in Hungary and other places, um, where the US and Europe generally have, um, have maybe a values-based and other interest in seeing those countries return to uh, their recent more liberal stances. Uh, but at the same time, if we push them too hard, 
maybe we're going to send them closer to Russia, which continues to have a strong interest in what goes on in Eastern Europe. So this seems like a very thorny problem that I'm sure you've dealt with extensively in your time in government. Um, what do you think we should be doing now about that? What, what can we do to, um, or what should we do to make sure countries like Hungary don't drift even further? Uh, into well, look. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest that you know the, the reason that the United States was able to uh, lead in that region and to really kind of set the tone for all the things that you've described after the end of the Cold War is because we were seen as a beacon of um, of values of um, human rights. We were a great supporter, and people saw a lot to admire in our own system. I have to say, and it's with great pain that I say that. That's not the case right now. I mean, many of the people who are listening today might have seen the recent Pew poll of, uh, several weeks ago that showed just how much our international standing has fallen. And look, it's not just because of the last four years. Those have been particularly painful and have contributed, um, you know, with the, the kind of the nature of our partisan infighting and just the personal style of, of the president. It was happening before. I mean, it was happening over successive um, administrations and a lot of it um, dates back to 2003 and the decision to go into Iraq. There was a huge upswelling of goodwill towards the United States after 9-11 uh, when we suffered the catastrophic terrorist attack. I think you know people were um, not thrilled that we went into Afghanistan but they understood um, why that was necessary of course and many of our NATO and other European allies supported that move and in fact fought alongside us in Afghanistan to try to stabilize the situation. 20 years on, you know, practically we're still um, trying to get ourselves out of that. It's not quite 20 years, of course, but I mean, it's um, next year will be, you know, the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Of, of but with Iraq, you know, we, we, we really, um, I think, lost a lot of our, um, uh, the goodwill there. You might remember there were a million people on the streets of London um, after the decision to go into Iraq was announced. So there's been a steady decline and erosion of then people's faith that the United States always knows when to do the right thing. And so, what do we need to do to turn this around now and to you know, be able to prevail upon the Hungary or other countries that are backsliding? We need to show that we can get our own democratic house in order. And I do think that the biggest test is for all of us, all of us um, you know, participating today, which is get out the vote, uh, you know, to show that we can have a massive turnout and that we can restore faith in democratic um, electoral systems. Because in all of these countries where we're seeing backsliding, that's the area that's being attacked. And it makes it very difficult when our own president is, you know, talking about rigged systems or, you know, risks, you know, to the ballot. And we're all fighting among each other, um, among ourselves and with each other about uh, a whole range of issues. The United States has shown time and time again over uh, all these decades, uh, the 20th and, um, you know, into this century, that we have the ability to work things out, to get our act together and to overcome you know, these difficulties. We overcame the catastrophe of the civil war in the 19th century. In the 20th century, you know, we've had so many uh, problems, but you know, we've shown the world that we're capable of moving forward on civil rights and on uh, universal suffrage. And, and we need to see to remember that. Uh, you know, we, we intervened to help Europe out in, uh, in, in World War I and, and, and World War II. We don't always have to be, intervene militarily, but we have to set an example. So I think that the biggest message that we could send, uh, not just to and miscreants, but um, also to our allies, is that we're capable of doing this again. So this is actually a pretty consequential moment that we're in now, a month before our presidential election, and we all have a part to play in that. I'm just curious, I don't know if you saw the piece in today's New York Times that Peter Beinart wrote, I don't know if it's today's technically Times, but it's up on the Times website, um, talking about um, uh, the problems with our democracy and uh, invoking the history of, of, of particularly Black Americans looking to the UN and other international bodies to kind of weigh in on the problems with American democracy. Uh, and so in light of everything that you just said and in light of your experience with so many countries that are fragile democracies uh, or maybe barely democracies, um, and given the importance of what you just said, do you think that the US is, or how would you characterize this moment for the US as a democracy, do you think that we can right the ship in the way that you just described? Um, we are facing an unprecedented election with many, as many commentators have pointed out, if these, if these events and statements, not just coming from Trump, but elsewhere, the problems with the Postal Service, et cetera, if this was happening in any other country, the headlines would suggest uh, you know, a drift towards, towards chaos. 
Uh, and maybe that is in fact what's going on, but I'm just curious how you see it given your long history looking, um, looking outward. Well, it, it really, this is a test. This is a reckoning for all of our institutions. Um, I mean, it's obvious that the person on top uh, matters a great deal, but as I said before, the 330 million of us, we've all got agency. And, you know, part of the strength um, of the um, United States is in its um, federal system. I mean, you know, I'm speaking to you in California, which if it was an independent state would be one of the largest and most prosperous in the world. And you've been a trendsetter in California. You've got an incredible vibrant and incredibly diverse population there. And often at the state level, you know, things can also be resolved and examples can be set. Um, obviously you're um, in the midst of a horrible crisis being on the front lines of climate change. And, uh, you know, but one thing that, you know, see there is how people are rallying to respond to that. We need to have the kind of metaphor of the volunteer firefighters who are literally putting themselves on the line to extinguish the fires in, um, in California. And that actually gives me hope because I know that there are, look, we saw what happened in 9-11, real firefighters and civilians pulling together. This is what we need right now for our democracy. And a lot of people like myself who've served in the administration are speaking out. You know, I wish more would speak out. You know, some of us spoke out earlier, you know, others are coming to the fore, basically saying, uh, you know, to everyone there, we have agency. There's we, the people in the US constitution, you know, we can do something about this. Now, if we don't show that we can't, we don't get out and vote in November, then yes, absolutely. I, you know, really do think that there's a, there's a major problem here. And I think, you know, I don't blame, you know, African-Americans for appealing to a higher power in terms of the United Nations. You know, actually in the United Kingdom, uh, not so long ago, there was a United Nations report on entrenched poverty. I grew up very poor in the north, north, uh, north of England, and it was like being a refugee in your own country. And, you know, the government wasn't recognizing, um, you know, the fact that, um, uh, you know, decades of uh, neglect had led to, um, you know, intolerable levels of poverty. And after, um, you know, 10 years of austerity uh, programs in the United Kingdom, a recent UN rapporteur's report showed that there was, um, you know, basically unacceptable levels of entrenched poverty, the kind of thing you should not expect in an OECD advanced country. The United States has the same. So we have to at least have the, the, the courage and, um, you know, to recognize when we've done things wrong and to try to fix them. And I, say, I do think that we have that ability. We have institutions. I mean, okay, they've been under assault um, over the last several years, but we also have an incredible um, just experience and reputation and practical evidence of philanthropy and of societal groups stepping up, again, using the volunteer firefighter metaphor. I mean, I've been really heartened by taking part in discussions like this, just seeing how many organizations at the grassroots, at the state and local government level are getting involved. So we can push change um, you know, by organizing and mobilizing at the state and local government level, as long as we have a, a permissive federal system that's not undermining us and you know, trying to stop this from happening. So I think, again, getting back to the other question, we can really set an example here, but we have to have the moral courage to step up and be able to tackle it. And we do have serious issues with race. We have serious issues with climate change. We have serious issues with poverty. We've got to have to tackle all of those and all the other things that, um, that are on the agenda. Agreed. I, I think Bill Clinton was the one who, who often said, there's nothing wrong with America that, that what's right with America can't fix. And that kind of optimism is, uh, is sort of what we need at this moment. So let me pivot back to, uh, to Russia specifically and the US-Russia relationship and ask you about the balance. So going back to the Cold War that, that you and I and probably any other viewers and listeners experienced personally, uh, but now seems like ancient history. But at that time we had a, you know, a, a constant struggle between deterrence on the one hand and detente on the other, and we would sort of pivot back and forth at various times. And I'm curious what you see as the right balance today between deterrence and detente with regard to Russia. So, so what should the West, you could answer it with regard to the US or the West generally, how should we strike that balance? Well, first of all, we need to um, you know, ask ourselves, do we really want to be in what could become a destructive confrontation with Russia from you know, here to eternity? And you know, talking back to the Cold War you know, in the 1980s, um, you know, I started studying Russian against the backdrop of the war scare um, when um, you know, this was the whole period of, um, Star Wars, you know, Ronald Reagan's um, ascent uh, to the presidency, another you know, son of California. 
and the um, the you know so-called Euro missile crisis or the SS20 Pershing missile crisis, when the United States was um, uh, wanting to station intermediate uh, nuclear missiles in the United Kingdom and you know other European countries, and then the Soviet Union was you know doing the same in uh, in Eastern Europe. And you know, we now know, because all these documents have been uh, declassified, that those of us who were growing up in that era weren't completely nuts to be practicing our duck and cover under our school desks and you know, worry where, <laughs> where would we be when the air raid or the nuclear the siren went off, because we were on the brink of a confrontation. The Soviets were looking you know, kind of, uh, for every sign of a first strike. They believed we were going to strike them as a whole uh, series of military maneuvers were going on. Now, fortunately, um, Reagan, um, uh, was um, able to engage Mikhail Gorbachev when he came along, you know, in the mid uh, 1980s into the whole series of arms control discussions that led to the INF Treaty and, you know, kind of the end, ultimately, of the Cold War. Uh, but, um, you know, this, um, you know, kind of really leads to a question about where are we now? Because those mechanisms and treaties that have held that relationship together and that have managed it have become uh, out of sync. We saw you know, what Russia was trying to do in 2016 in trying to um, interfere in our elections. The Russians persist in seeing us as a threat. We won't get away from that because they look at any capability and capacity to hurt them and threaten them in some way, including through cyber attacks, not just nuclear attacks. And they want to minimize and eliminate if possible that threat. We all know that in life, it's impossible to eliminate threats. There will always be that threat perception. So we need to you know, um, be realistic we know that you know Russia doesn't see us as a friend and still sees us as a geopolitical uh, competitor and at times sees us as a major threat and will try to push back against us. So we need to have deterrence. We need to have a tough response to when you know Russia does something like interfere in our elections or poison people, um, which they seem to do on a propensity all these kind of brazen assassination attempts, including in small English towns and things that may or may not have been done here in the United States. But we also need to see if we can get back to that atmosphere that um, you know, you're referring to towards the end of the Cold War detente, when it was really kind of managed stability. We professionalized and stabilized the relationship and we managed to head off the most destructive aspects of confrontation. So you know, it's not really realistic to think that you know, like in the 90s when the Cold War ended, we're all gonna be great friends and we're all gonna be part of the same you know, strategic partnerships, but we need to try to see if we can stabilize. So we need to start with pushing back on what the Russians have done uh, of late, these new techniques or old techniques of propaganda mixed with cyber you know, techniques that they've um, used to attack us in 2016 and in other act actions. But then we have to try to find ways of sitting down with them on arms control and on other finding other mechanisms to stabilize a relationship so we can get back to at least um, an atmosphere of mutual restraint where we're not attacking each other all the time and that we can focus on some of the things like pandemics or fires. I mean, Siberia has been burning as well. And you might remember there was a point when the Russians offered to send, you know, they've got a long history in California um, over some firefighting, you know, equipment and planes over from uh, Russia. And, you know, we kind of batted that off as, you know, not being particularly practical. But if we could get into a mode where we could help each other out in extremis, that would be an achievement. So pandemics, climate change are issues that we need to tackle together. We need to find a way of prizing up in a small door where we can cooperate on existential threats to both of us. It makes me think of in the 70s when the Helsinki Accords and talks were taking place, that was part of the impetus was to find things, I mean, maybe not existential crises, but find things that we could cooperate on uh, so yeah. that we could build cooperation for other things. I'm just curious, right. you mentioned in passing, which of course I completely agree with that, the 90s were a different time vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US and Russia. And you said, well, we can't recapture that. Um, so why not? What, 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 what would you identify as the chief reasons why we, we had a moment of closeness uh, or at least some degree of, it was a different thing after the end of the Cold War between Russia and the West and, uh, and that's gone. Um, is it because of the expansion of NATO? What are the reasons that you think it's never coming back? I think it was kind of, there was a sense of sort of euphoria that led to misplaced expectations of what was possible. You know, I think that, um, you know, certainly, um, I mean, I was working on all of this at the time on the Soviet side under Gorbachev. I mean, we, there was an effort to kind of bring the Soviet Union into, um, you know, Western mechanisms. 
and you know kind of Gorbachev and others were pretty convinced that Western leaders at the time had promised there'd be no expansion of NATO, that you know Russia, the Soviet Union would be an equal partner. And when they meant equal, they thought equal to the United States, having a special relationship, and you know the Soviet Union wouldn't end up being looked as like France or Germany, or the UK or Poland or anything like this. That there would be kind of special provisions for the Soviet Union. And even after the collapse of the Soviet Union with Russia as a successor state, for a couple of years there was this sort of feeling that you know Russia would be you know treated as sort of a, a, a special partner in NATO, the NATO Russia Council would mean that Russia would have a veto. It would be like in the United Nations when you know Russia was part of the big boys club. And you know we didn't see that. We just thought well Russia would just be one of the many. And it, so immediately you know we kind of uh, lost um, you know that sort of feeling of possibility. And then we ended up in recrimination resentment. So I think you know we well, can't- Was that a mistake? on the part of the West? Well, I think that, I think it was misplaced expectations on both sides. And then we, we didn't really know how to talk to each other quite so well, we didn't, we didn't have the structures. There was a lot of assumptions made on both sides that, you know, proved to be, we had a lot of hubris, you know, we thought we'd won the Cold War when really, you know, kind of basically the Soviet Union fell apart because of its own internal contradictions. It wasn't, you know, just because of overextension, you know, in arms control, but we, you know, we, we told ourselves a narrative of what happened. And they had a kind of a, nar a narrative about what happened, which, you know, frankly, is very similar to some of our own domestic narratives. Then the Soviet collapse, it was a little like the Confederacy after um, the Civil War. Uh, the, you know, Soviet uh, collapse led to people thinking it was a lost cause or if things could have been differently and that they were being mistreated. Some of the, you know, similar problems that we have in US politics today and the politics of grievance emerged. And we didn't address that head on. And, um, you know, a lot of um, projections were made that were false, but, you know, we, we weren't, I think we were also preoccupied with our own issues and our own interpretations of what had happened. We wanted the peace dividend. You know, we thought that we were, you know, kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the um, you know, masters of a new universe, of the, you know, the end of history, remember all of the things that were written at that point. And we didn't really perceive that actually, we probably needed to do some rethinking and start from scratch, not thinking that all of our systems would prevail. So I think, you know, by now we've got a reckoning, you know, 30 years on. It's not just, um, you know, where we are with Russia, but where we are ourselves, because there was a lot of problems within the United States that we just glossed over. And, you know, we, we failed to deal with. I mean, race um, is an, an issue that has plagued us um, for decades, um, you know, after Reconstruction, when that failed, and the Voters' Rights Act, and you know, after all of you know the civil rights um, movements, you know, kind of ran out of steam, we just pat ourselves on the back and think, you know, that was all fine, and it really wasn't. So, I mean, this was really what this the Russians were telling us: you need perestroika as well, but we just you know kind of brushed that off. And you're a Putin expert you've written a book about Putin, you know about Putin at, at many levels, you've studied him for a long time. In light of the history that you just recounted, you know, one of the things that people often point to about Putin is that, you know, he witnessed this collapse and, and maybe defeat, depending on how you want to characterize it, of the Soviet Union, uh, and, um, you know, wants to bring back, and maybe arguably has brought back, some of Russia's power, swagger, uh, uh, status. And so I'm curious, and I know you wrote recently, I think it was in Politico with several others, you talked about um, kind of the US-Russia uh, relationship. And I know you've noted that Putin has, in some ways we can understand him in traditional Russian nationalist terms, that he's coming uh, from a strategic stance that is rooted in sort of some traditional things. And it made me think about Kennan writing early on in the Cold War and, and in, in the Long Telegram and sources of Soviet conduct. And, Kennan spoke about the ways that um, uh, we could understand the Soviet Union uh, also in some traditional ways. And so I'm just curious, is there, uh, is there sort of a through line that Russia has constantly uh, exhibited even with different forms of government and different leaders? Um, is there a lot of com commonality or do we see something really different today in the way Russia behaves? No, there is a lot of commonality. I mean, Kennan's long telegram is just as fresh you know, now as it was back in the 1940s. I mean, it's a really a remarkable document. Uh, but, you know, it really reflects that remarkable continuity in many respects. I mean, Russia um, is one of um, the world's oldest states. Um, even as an empire, it has survived when others have long gone. I mean, the Russian Federation today um, is still the largest country in 
landmass in the world. And um, it was still consists of, of regions that were you know, kind of acquired uh, during um, imperial expansion that kind of dates back centuries. So it's, it's kind of a remarkable country. And you know, again, you know, Russia had outposts in California, Fort Ross and you know, all the way down uh, California, different points. We're on an Arctic power because Russia sold us Alaska. You know, we have to remember just, you know, the, 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 the vast uh, influence that uh, Russia had at, uh, at different points. And that is kind of, you know, also rooted in a mentality of being this big geographical uh, fact of life, as well as a, as a major player in multiple regions uh, that shapes a lot of uh, Russia's mindsets. Now, where Russia is different now than it was before is it's really its level of integration with the rest of the world, notwithstanding the fact that you know the Russia outposts in you know the uh, earlier times in California and Alaska, it wasn't that Russia was kind of out there on the international stage in the way that it is today, or its um, its people weren't. You know, you you had Russian emigres, but they tended to not kind of maintain their links with the old country. I mean, America also has a very large Russian diaspora, but you just don't really think about it, because unlike the Armenian diaspora we were talking about, there's not a kind of communal bonds. It's different waves of emigration uh, that come out of the Russian Empire, and obviously peoples of uh, different um, different ethnicities and you know different cultures, because it's, again, it's a multicultural empire. Uh, but what we do see now is much more, you know, kind of Russians, Russian students, um, Russian business people, Russian money, not just you know, Russian operatives, you know, running around all over the place, Russian culture, uh, not just the high culture, but um, Hollywood, you know, has had a lot of Russian directors uh, coming over. Um, you know, one of my particular favorites was um, uh, um, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer <laughs> made by <laughs> a Russian director who hailed from Central Asia. You know, again, a totally um, you know, interesting phenomenon that we've not really had before. So this actually does raise questions from the future. Lots sort of continuity like all countries have, but will that fact of kind of greater engagement since the end of the Cold War really lead to something over the longer term? We can't think that Vladimir Putin is forever. Some, you know, kind of cultural patterns um, of very persistent uh, geopolitical outlooks uh, tend to persist. But there is also, I think, a lot of opportunity for Russia to be over time a different country. And we shouldn't write off the possibility that at some point in the future, we could have, um, you know, the kind of relationship with Russia that, you know, I personally wish, you know, we'd had all along. It doesn't have to be like this. Great, great. I think that's a terrific uh, point to, to pivot to the many questions that have uh, come in through the Q&A feature. And for those of you listening and watching, please continue to send in questions. But I'll be honest, there's quite a few and there's some good ones. So um, so let me let me start off with those, if that's OK. So um, so first one is is related to some some current events. So uh, the question is, what role and interests uh, does Russia have related to yesterday's development in Kyrgyzstan? Uh, vote rigging, storming of the parliament, invalidation of election results, et cetera. Do you care to comment on that? Well, I mean, R Russia probably had nothing to do with anything that was going on in the um, Kyrgyz parliamentary elections. And I, I think we should kind of remind people, unfortunately, for several decades now, Kyrgyzstan has repeatedly had um, contested elections, presidential and parliamentary, and also um, some horrible um, uh, you know, basically inter-ethnic riots and uh, pogroms um, in Osh and Kyrgyzstan between ethnic Kyrgyz and Uzbeks. Um, Kyrgyzstan has, was particularly hard hit by the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, the country was, um, you know, left as one of the poorest um, of those that emerged out of the Soviet Union. It's had a really hard time finding its political center because, you know, the uh, Kyrgyz um, did not have um, a history of independent statehood previously. They were part of the sort of nomadic peoples with a few, um, you know, settled populations that were just incorporated into this inexorable um, expansion of uh, the Russian Empire at various points. So, um, you know, what's happening in Kyrgyzstan has happened before. I was there um, at times when there were kind of previous upheavals like this. The question is really, um, you know, should the Russians say anything about it? Because, you know, now we've got a similar contested election going on in Belarus, which is much more pertinent to what's happening in, in Russia, because in that case, it wasn't just the manipulation of a um, parliamentary uh, election. It's, uh, you know, the effort by uh, President Lukashenko of Belarus 
Belarus has already been in power for about 26 years to stay in power even longer. And that's what Putin has been trying to do with amendments to the constitution, potentially stay in power till 2036, you know, by which time he would have been president for 36 years and the longest, you know, serving Russian president, you know, exceeding Stalin and, you know, some of the czars. And, um, you know, I mean, that, that kind of, um, you know, development in Belarus where, again, a grassroots um, protest against, um, Lukashenko staying and staying and staying and staying some more, you know, has caused some real heartburn in Moscow. So there'll be a lot of concern about what's happening in Kyrgyzstan and questions about who steps in to resolve that. And again, we, the United States, are kind of missing in action because we would have, you know, probably stepped in there. Um, and previous disputes over elections in Kyrgyzstan, the United States, along with Russia, Uzbekistan and some other, you know, regional players actually helped to affect an interim government. Um, you know, I just, and with Nagorno-Karabakh raging where we started off, there just seems to be a little bit too much on the agenda here. And, you know, the kind of question is who would step in and who would, you know, assist. The European Union, um, you know, might play a role. They've had special envoys there before. The normal play would be the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, which is also a potential. But that um, organization, we've also tended not to pay much attention to it, um, although we have a you know, reasonably good um, ambassador there who's a former governor of a US state. Uh, but the Russians have defunded the OSCE. That was set up to help with things like this. And we've had a kind of a crisis about all of the senior officials there. So we've got kind of interim uh, leaders. So we've kind of challenged in institutions as well. So unfortunately, um, you know, we, we're seeing that the absence of US leadership not necessarily US military intervention, but the absence of consistent, coherent US leadership is contributing to all kinds of problems um, internationally. And Kyrgyzstan is part of that picture. Great, okay. So uh, next question, has the combination of Brexit and US partisanship made it more difficult for NATO's influence and example setting? So maybe relevant to what you just said, but more generally, how do those two fit together? Absolutely. I mean, it just means that we're so preoccupied with our own affairs that we can't project ourselves. I mean, just exactly as I was talking about before. I mean, Brexit has, you know, since 2016, dragged the United Kingdom down and down and down into further spirals. You know, kind of the Boris Johnson was, um, you know, recently elected as prime minister or as the conservatives were elected into office and he was prime minister with the idea of getting Brexit done and nobody knows what that means. And it's just similarly here in the United States that we no longer know what our partisan fighting is about. And, you know, in polls, um, we see that the majority of Americans still think we have a lot more in common than uh, all these disputes over uh, individual issues. So we tend to focus in on tactical issues. The Supreme Court justice, you know, obviously is a pretty major issue, but it's still a tactical dispute. And it also masks, uh, you know, the fact that Americans still, you know, see a lot in common, still believe in um, the future of the United States. And, you know, with Britain um, too, that, you know, people have become divided of this whole issue with Brexit because nobody, you know, kind of knows what it's about and have lost sight of, you know, what it is that also kind of brings uh, Britain together. So we need to address that before we can, you know, really move on and uh, get our institutions like uh, NATO back up and running again. I think both the UK and the United States will have to recommit to NATO in the future. And we'll have to think about how NATO operates in a world that's no longer the Cold War, which, you know, we haven't really, um, you know, tackled in a, in a meaningful way. We've upgraded, you know, thinking about it from here to there, but not sat down in a, you know, serious fashion and looked at all the individual elements that, you know, we have to deal with. How do you deal with the pandemic, you know, from a NATO perspective? What about, you know, the rise of China? Immigration and migration and all the refugee flows, you know, through the Mediterranean have been a vexing problem because it's not really a NATO area. So, you know, how does NATO, you know, it doesn't have to do it wholesale, but how does it come up with solutions for some of these, you know, kind of near term current problems, climate change, for example, as well, and the security risks from that. Great. So uh, next question relates to Putin. Uh, what can you tell us, uh, in addition to your congressional testimony about Trump's quote, intense attachment to Putin? How would you explain that? Well, in look, I think, that, you know, Putin um, has become an iconic figure. Putin spends a lot, an awful lot of time at image cultivation. He's the ultimate strongman. You know, I mean, 
we don't really have a lot of other probably thankfully world leaders you know kind of running around on horseback or doing the butterfly across um, Siberian uh, you know rivers I mean he's got the ultimate um, or has had the ultimate macho image it's a very macho image um, now of late uh, Putin has been very interestingly um, out of the picture beyond the television screens because he's being very careful to avoid catching COVID and um, you know he has not been out and about uh, since he had a very unfortunate uh, near uh, brush with the possibility of infection when he visited um, a major hospital very early on in the um, in the pandemic, shook the hand of the doctor before donning a hazmat suit and the doctor later um, uh, tested positive. Since then, Putin has kind of um, retreated and I still seen in charge, you know, on Zoom calls like we are now, but it's a bit difficult to project that. But the overall... Uh, image of Putin, I think, is what is the fascination. I mean, we've seen our own president, you know, kind of showing right now that he's not going to be defeated by COVID. Putin's not going to catch it in the first instance. Um, and he's kind of showing a different uh, kind of message there. And he's been very focused on the science and, you know, kind of delegating authority and everything. But it's that image of the strong man, the, the macho leader, and frankly, the biggest figure, along with President Xi on the world stage, that I think has been uh, part of that attraction. It's, it not about Russia. The... it's not about Russia per se, it's about the image of Putin. Interesting. Yeah, it is fascinating that Putin has taken such a kind of rational approach to COVID. And, and it does, I mean, you know so much more than I do, but it does seem like, certainly based on what you just said and everything I've read, he's actually handled it, taken it seriously. Um, and if there was one thing I wish Trump would learn, from him, it would be that. But unfortunately, Trump seems to have taken all the other lessons and not that one. There's a lot of other things that Putin does, by the way, is that he doesn't um, play on divisions uh, within the country because he knows that that's what brought down the Soviet Union. So um, he may go after, in a really brazen and horrible fashion, someone like Alexei Navalny, because you know, Alexei Navalny is dangerous and uh, to him as a kind of a, a threat because he actually also appears to Russian nationalist base. But he's also not emblematic of all of the different groups that Putin needs to have as support. So what Putin does in this carefully crafted and very choreographed image of himself is he also appeals to all kinds of different constituencies in, uh, in Russia. You know, yes, he's seen with bikers and, you know, kind of what we would see as kind of right wing quasi white supremacists, but he's also seen with rabbis and muftis in the heads of uh, the Muslim community. He reaches out to them. He has an incredibly diverse group of people, you know, in his uh, entourages and, and backgrounds. He pays great respect uh, to uh, different constituencies, both ethnic and religious um, inside of Russia. And he tries to head off any kind of prospect of inter-ethnic violence because he knows how dangerous that um, is and how much he could rip the country apart. So Putin is actually very rational when he appears irrational and he does the, you know, kind of wild man, you know, dangerous threat, Richard, Richard Nixon, you know, be careful, I've got my finger on the button routine, that is calculated, it's deliberate. Great, fantastic. So there are many, many questions uh, about the, uh, I'll just pick one because it kind of gets to the core, which is how do you view the American, Russian, Chinese triangle? And so all of the questions that address this in one way or another kind of ask some version of how do these three mega uh, powers fit together? What should the US be doing vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Should we, you know, we, this is not a new triangle. Um, this goes back for decades, um, but it has a different valence today given how powerful China really is um, economically, obviously politically, diplomatically today. So, um, so you can take that any, any direction you like. Well, it also has a different valence because of the nature of the Russian Chinese relationship, which I think is, you know, where you were heading, you know, with this as well. Because if we think during the Cold War, you know, the Soviet Union and China weren't all that close. And in fact, they'd come to blows over um, the demarcation of their border out in the Russian Far East in the 60s and 70s. And there was a lot of tension in the Gorbachev period because Gorbachev was pushing forward with Perestroika at a time when China was obviously grappling with Tiananmen Square and similar 
uh, upswelling of popular pressures. And you might remember, you know, Gorbachev made a visit to China, you know, around that same time. And the Chinese were making it very clear that they didn't want anything to do with perestroika and that they were going to um, clamp down, and which is, of course, what we saw. And the Chinese, of course, felt very much vindicated when you had the collapse of the Soviet Union and they kept it together. Now, um, you know, today, um, Putin uh, has been very careful in the cultivation of his relationship with China. I mean, it started also with Boris Yeltsin being quite nervous about, you know, a weak Russia in the 1990s and still having, you know, these open wounds of border disputes with China. Central Asian countries, you know, the same, but it's like Kazakhstan have these enormous borders with China. And so there was a there was a move to quickly resolve all of the border disputes and then to try to create a kind of strategic friendship, partnership like um, arrangement, you know, very loose and not well defined uh, with China to try to stabilize that. Now, Russia has really spent a lot of uh, time on uh, China and um, trying to improve that relationship as we've seen the rise of China economically. But there's a great deal of anxiety in the background. And I'm sure even more so when we saw clashes between China and India on their disputed border in the Himalayas that, ooh, hang on, what if, you know, later on China decides to go back to this area in the Russian Far East that was once China's, you know, back into the 19th century? Um, and, you know, well, they want this again. You know, we've, we've resolved all of this. But the Russians themselves with Crimea had said that was resolved with Ukraine and then said, Oops, circumstances change, we'd like Crimea back. You know, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that something similar could happen down the line if China feels powerful and suspects, you know, Russia of weakness and inattentiveness in the Russian Far East. So you see Russia really trying to get closer to China and we've contributed towards that because of sanctions and you know all of our responses to what Russia did in 2016 and before that and the annexation of Crimea, all the stuff that they've done in Ukraine, you know, and really this um, downward spiral in our relationship. And of course, we've you know been confronting China and the territorial disputes in the Indo-Pacific region uh, and also China with its predatory economic practices. And when we've taken harsh steps about against both and sanctions, it's kind of pulled them together. I don't think China sees, you know, Russia as a long term, you know, massive, you know, global uh, strategic partner. But I think that they um, also really greatly benefit from that relationship, particularly in the UN, you know, kind of it's kind of like a two guys you know, blocking together, uh, you know, US efforts, pushing back on, you know, kind of all the kinds of things the US uh, wants to do in you know, various regions where they've got kind of shared interests, but they're also, you know, brushing up against each other in uncomfortable ways, everywhere from the Antarctic to the Arctic to Africa. And, you know, it's not always that easy. And the Chinese definitely see Russia as subservient in some regards. And I say that deliberately as a kind of a, a second player, a little brother, which is not how the Soviet Union saw itself with China back in the past. So, um, you know, it's difficult now. It's kind of, a strange triangle. We're on the outs with both China and Russia. You know, they're kind of playing with each other. And, you know, um, Russia at one point was trying to play the seams between you know, the United States and China and offer it to be a bridge. They've done that with the Japanese and the Koreans as well at times, South Koreans. Oh, you know, we can help you with your difficult relationship with China. But, you know, if you're thrown in your lot with China, you know, then the kind of question is how far will Russia go? Would Russia back China up on Taiwan, for example? Would Russia back um, China up if it took more aggressive actions, you know, against um, Japan in a, in a dispute or South Korea? And that's not entirely clear. It's easy when they've got us to play off against, but when it comes to sort of third party issues, you know, it's not um, uh, clear at all how that might play out. But I think we have to be mindful of how it's changed and how we also have to tread very carefully in um, thinking about how we manage that relationship, including on nuclear weapons, where, you know, we want to have an arms control agreement for the future that brings in China, but it's going to be very hard to sequence that. And Russia doesn't want to look like it's pitted against China in the Asia Pacific region, where China's intermediate nuclear weapons are as much of a threat to Russia as they are to uh, the United States. Great, great. So several questions about the election. Um, we touched on that briefly in our, our discussion before. And, you know, I guess I would distill some of this down as what's different in 2020 versus what we saw in 2016. 
what kinds of uh, interference do you, do, you, do you think is happening now from Russia uh, or do you anticipate in the coming weeks? Well, we're seeing, you know, some of the same stuff that we did before. If you look at reports from Facebook and others of um, Twitter and, you know, the kind of uh, use of fake personas, there's been reports of fake media outlets, um, you know, duping uh, American, you know, journalists who are, you know, stringers who are looking for, um, you know, a kind of a medium to work with and to writing for them. Um, some of the ransomware attacks. I mean, obviously there's concern that that might be, you know, the Russians. We've done a lot since 2016 to tell people that to uh, strengthen our critical infrastructure, all of us are more aware now of phishing attempts and hacking and the need for three factor identification, authentication, and being very careful about, you know, when you click on your mother's puppy video that she sent, you might not be a mother, you know, kind of, um, we all have to, I think, you know, realize we play a part in this. I think everybody has since 2016, Facebook, Twitter and others have done quite a lot now to self-regulate and um, set up task forces to figure out what's happening. I think they could do a lot more. But um, you know, the biggest problem remains our own polarization um, and our own domestic actors talking down our system and spreading their own disinformation. So that is something that you know we have to tackle ourselves. And that's kind of you know part of the problem in going into 2020. You know, it's the postal office, uh, the postal service, and you know our own um, government defunding it. Uh, you know, these are threats, uh, but they're coming from uh, domestic actors. And do you view those domestic threats, like let's say the post office itself, the problems it's faced, as larger than the ones we see emanating from abroad, whether from Russia or or elsewhere? We have to remember that most of these influence operations um, take what's already there. You know, they, they, they can't work if we don't have problems because they use our problems against us. It's kind of like leveraging our own vulnerabilities and weaknesses. So the countries that fare best, you know, albeit small countries, you know, countries like a Finland that, you know, their eyes are wide open. And this is, a, you know, a country with a pretty tight um, you know, social um, compact and contract. You know, the, the, their institutions are pretty strong. You know, the Australians were under attack from the Chinese and they kind of pulled together to push this back and had a you know, national uh, debate uh, about it. You know, they, they were experiencing the same kind of things that we had with Russia from China and had to tackle it. You know, it's a smaller population, but a big country. And, you know, they, they face many of uh, the same problems. Um, you know, there are other countries in Europe that have, you know, tried to, you know, tried to tackle this. So we, we have to um, basically get our own act together and recognise that, Many of the vulnerabilities of our own making, dirty money, you know, kind of uh, corruption. We have to self-regulate. We have to put into um, practice our own anti-money laundering uh, laws because, you know, the Russians take advantage of cutouts where they can, you know, pay proxies to do uh, various things as well. Clean up our act, you know, get rid of corrupt co politicians. There are a whole host of um, legislative efforts going through Congress at the moment that try to tackle this. I mean, some of our own um, uh, states um, in, in, uh, in the US are major international centers for money laundering. We could, you know, kind of be tackling that. It's not just the Seychelles and Cayman Islands that everybody thinks about. It's here in the US as well. Great, okay. So I think we have time for one more question and um, I'll pose one that came in about Crimea. Uh, so is there a way to, that the questioner characterizes it as the Crimea impasse, but is there a way to address that or what should the US be doing about Crimea? Well, this is definitely an impasse. I mean, what we should be doing is not forgetting that it's there. Um, you know, when we had the same situation with the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, after they were annexed, um, you know, during World War II and, you know, took all the way you know, until the end of the Cold War for them to regain their independence. So, you know, it's not to say that um, there, there couldn't be a shift here. Uh, so, you know, we don't just ignore it and pretend it's not there, but it is definitively an impasse because just like with the Baltic states, um, you know, the, the Russians have incorporated Crimea into the Russian Federation um, in a de facto sense. You know, they're kind of creating infrastructural realities on the ground, like the big, you know, bridge over the Kerch Strait that also led to um, a standoff with the uh, Ukrainians uh, recently. And, you know, they're trying to kind of find more and more ways of knitting, you know, Crimea into Russia and pulling it away from uh, Ukraine. So we just have to be very cognizant of that, uh, of that fact. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Fiona, for coming on and, and meeting and talking with all of us uh, remotely uh, from your um, undisclosed location somewhere in the DC area. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope we can bring you back to UCLA at some point. No, thanks so much. I mean, it's great to uh, be there. It'd be nice to be there in person. And um, thank you to everyone for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks, thanks. everyone. Take care, Carl. Bye-bye.